is Palau, a Pacific Island Republic 500 miles from the Philippines. Today is election day for Palau's 9,000 registered voters. For Palauans, there is much at stake. Their land, their culture, their future as a nation. For many, it will be a final test of the American-style democracy learned during 40 years as a United Nations trust territory of the United States. But above all, it is the sixth plebiscite in eight years whose outcome hangs on one essential issue, the Nuclear Sovereignty Clause in Palau's Constitution. This clause bans nuclear weapons and power plants from being used, tested, or stored within Palau's borders without approval of 75% of the votes cast in a referendum on this specific question. The clause was first approved by Palau's voters in 1979 by a margin of 9 to 1. You probably know most of our modern ships are nuclear powered, and particularly those we use for long distances from their home ports in uh, West Coast or Hawaii. And that means that virtually any ship that we are apt to have operating in Palauan waters for Palau's defense will be nuclear powered. Well, uh, that ship may have to put into Palauan waters, and under the Palauan Constitution, as written, it couldn't do so. We don't intend to, uh, to restrict our ability uh, to, to defend the Pacific Basin, and, uh, and we're not going to. Termed unacceptable by the U.S., the first Constitution was nullified. Then, an alternate one was proposed that did permit transit of nuclear materials. A 72% majority rejected it. In a third plebiscite held in 1980, the original Constitution was reinstated by a 78% majority. The voters' nuclear ban was motivated by fear and by experience. September 15, 1944. United States Marines hit the beaches of Peleliu. Their islands had been a World War II battleground. Later, they had seen the effects of U.S. nuclear testing elsewhere in Micronesia. In the Marshall Islands, despite a U.N. charter making the United States responsible for the people's health and safety, more nuclear bombs have been tested than anywhere else in the world. Marshall Islanders became human guinea pigs in long-term radiation experiments that will damage all their future generations. That was why Palauans saw nuclear sovereignty as a necessity and a fundamental human right. That was why they made it the cornerstone of history's first nuclear-free national constitution. It has drawn international attention and support. In a certain sense, those people are only asking uh, what a majority of the people in the United States and Western Europe are requesting. Joanne, thank you so much for taking time out from your busy schedule to talk with us. The, the people of Palau, 7,000 voters, have in effect taken on the entire United States here. What do you think are their chances of winning? I don't know what their chances of winning are, but I certainly hope they'll win because they have every right to be nuclear free. We have no right to impose that on them. Today's vote is on a proposed compact of free association with the United States. Two previous versions of the compact, giving the U.S. nuclear use rights, have failed to win sufficient voter approval. This version would give the U.S. nuclear transit rights, while neither confirming nor denying the presence of nuclear materials. This is the ballot. It does not mention the nuclear issue. Palauans ask if this constitutes the separate referendum specifically on the nuclear question called for by their constitution. The shadows of two events from Palau's recent history hang over this election. The first is the assassination last year of Palau's first president, Haruo Remelik. Accused as conspirators are relatives of Remelik's chief political rival. The trial is scheduled to begin four days after the election. Its irregularities will warrant intervention by the American Civil Liberties Union. Elected to replace the slain president was Lazarus Salih, 
who, as Palau's chief compact negotiator, has made repeated attempts to bargain away the nuclear sovereignty 92% of the voters said they wanted. The second shadow over the plebiscite is the Ipsico power plant scandal. Here it is, a 16 megawatt generator for an area with predicted power needs of less than 9 megawatts. Built at inflated cost by a now bankrupt British company called Ipsico. A $32 million deal involving alleged bribery and conflicts of interest made with the apparent approval of Washington that would ultimately be paid for by U.S. tax dollars. If, that is, the compact is passed. Meanwhile, Palau is being sued for default on payments for the still inoperative power plant. Interest mounts at the rate of thousands a day. But these are not the only pressures bearing on this plebiscite. Bena Sakuma is the director of the political education program on the compact. The, the pressure is very evident, you know. Ever since we rejected the last uh, two or three compacts, you know, a proposal, suddenly we don't have money for uh, medi medicine. Suddenly we don't have money for school supplies. So there is definitely uh, some kind of concerted effort to get us to succumb to the economic pressures that we're facing. For example, every time we're getting close to compact uh, plebiscite or anything like that, then our generator goes off. And then we are on uh, what we call a uh, power ration, you know. And it's been on for the, last, uh, for the last month, you know. And I'm not saying it is timed, but it's just that it is uh, difficult, you know, to not to think that, uh, not to think that this power generator is going to uh, go better when the compact goes on, you know. Because they say that, you know, we're going to give you uh, money to do this and that and all these things. And somehow we are under impression that uh, we seem to feel our need much more before plebiscites than any other time. Yeah. It's a good timing, too. I mean, Palau is such a small nation that doesn't even have a military and things like that. And it's so easy to squeeze them economically to be able to succumb to the uh, mighty nation of the United States regarding the nuclear issue. If they can do that to Japan, if they can do that to New Zealand, they surely can do it to us, you know? Like they say in the beginning, there's only 15,000 of them. Who gives a damn? Educator Bernie Keldermans has led Palau's grassroots opposition to the compact. There's a fear. There's a fear around here. And so they'd rather not go to the poll. They're afraid to, to, to be considered uh, what? antagonist or not uh, being respectful to, their, to the, the, their leaders in the in the village. If you're in a, a very small village with only 50-some people, the voters are there. They know who goes for what. Mm -hmm. So some places they run away from, from the village to come to Koror to, be, to vote in the central box. So there's, there's a fear. There's a fear around here. And so they'd rather not go to the polls. Total vote cast, 275, 275. I'm not going to do nothing. 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 Once Palau's chief compact negotiator, Governor Roman Matul has campaigned against previous versions. Was there enough time? Uh, before the, blo the vote for the issues to be made clear? This is a very, very complicated uh, document. It's meant to be so. And uh, I doubt if there is more than five people who really understand the, the compact initiative, talking about the whole population of Palau. There is, there is confusion, um, particularly at the, at the village level. Trusteeship Council President Gore Booth leads the UN team observing the plebiscite. It does, in some cases, concern the uh, issue which perhaps has been the most difficult, which is the, the nuclear issue. We've been asking if it's true 
that we're voting for the plebiscite and at the same time you're amending our constitution and they said no you're not and we don't see um, the difference we see it's, it is uh, it's very clear that if you get 75 percent then it, it becomes a constitutional issue for us we stand by our constitution i think we need all the legal advice that we can get but as since i'm not a lawyer and uh, it's still very clear that no nuclear in the juris uh, jurisdiction of Palau and whether it is a, a ship or a, an airplane uh, run by nuclear fuel, it's still a nuclear coming in. That's a very uh, far-fetched conclusion to, to come out of the compact because the constitution of Palau does not prohibit transit. And that's clear. And so the compact allows transit. The president's office and, and the Palau Congress, the both houses of Palau Congress, the governors and the chief have endorsed the compact of association. And they are the ones that have hired people, I mean, organized the committee of uh, political educators to hire people to do the job. And most of these people I hire to do the political education are staff of the presidents and legislature, and uh, they are work in the administration itself. And uh, knowing fully well that all the ministers and uh, directors of the uh, bureau of the government are campaigning for the compact, they 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 have meetings of all the department, and they openly campaign for the compact. The whole leadership is campaigning for the compact. It, it is very hard for the political education to hold uh, everybody down and walk on that thin line of uh, neutrality. I know that our constitution is anti-nuclear and uh, it still stands. I would be telling uh, people to vote and if they don't know, to reject it. But even though they know that the compact is not good, they still feel that we don't have any choice. What we should do is sit and decide as a nation so decide for once what you want instead of uh, uh, being pushed and being imposed and people are so tired not physically but mentally people are so tired going to the poor and we stand by our constitution it's still very clear no nuclear in the jurisdiction of Palau. Mr. President, there's been a lot of talk about the compact needing to pass by a simple majority or by 75 percent. Uh, can you tell us what the outcome of the vote has been and what your interpretation of that is? Yeah, the outcome of the vote was uh, 72 percent uh, approval by the voters of Palau. The compact requires only a simple majority to be approved according to the constitutional processes in Palau. The result is official. 72.2% passage of the compact. Here is how this compares with the two previous compact votes. Does the, the provisions that uh, have been achieved in this compact, are they satisfactory to the United States? We signed it, and we agreed to it. Uh, it goes before the goes before the Congress for their determination if uh, it's satisfactory to Congress. It's satisfactory to the administration. Uh, and does, in your view, the the nuclear free provision of Palau's constitution remain intact? That's up for them to decide. I can't comment on that. The government uh, has proclaimed a ratification on the compact, but once you know that in the previous referendum they have been always claiming a victory uh, 
even though they did not achieve 75 percent requirement nuclear is only one of the uh, the elements that uh, the people here is fighting one of the biggest concern is the land people here are very attached to to the land and under the compact of free association the government of united states can take any lands any size and and shape and form within 60 days and the uh, local people would not have any recourse of getting their lands people here uh, have been able to survive in the last 400 years under four nations because of their lands. Once the land is is uh, disposed or destroyed, then I don't think the, our society will be able to endure. Palau is not alone in affirming its nuclear sovereignty, its right to ban nuclear materials from its jurisdiction. Since the passage of its constitution, 3,000 cities in over 17 countries have voted to become nuclear-free zones. In July 1985, leaders of 13 nations met to declare the South Pacific nuclear-free by international treaty. One of those nations was New Zealand, whose own sweeping nuclear ban has also triggered strong opposition from Washington. When Prime Minister Longy denied port access to this United States ship, presumed to be nuclear, the trouble with the U.S. began. We do consider the uh, denial of port access as a matter of grave concern, which goes to the core of our mutual obligation as allies. It's our deepest hope that New Zealand will restore the traditional cooperation that has existed between our two countries. Allies must work together as partners to meet their shared responsibilities. The United States became worried that Longy would become a kind of Pied Piper of pacifist countries. Well, I think it uh, sets a very bad precedent. I think that you'll see uh, consequences flowing to uh, possibly Australia, uh, possibly to Japan and other regions. Some Western countries have anti-nuclear and other movements which seek to diminish defense cooperation among the allied states. We would hope that our response to New Zealand would signal that the course these movements advocate would not be cost-free. We have a long history of being anti-nuclear. We proposed in 75 a South Pacific nuclear-free zone. We are going to work to protect that this year. We have not given comfort to the Soviet bloc. We have not undermined the West. But the result has been that we have been told by some officials in the United States administration that our decision is not, as they put it, to be cost-free. We are actually told that New Zealanders cannot decide for themselves how to defend New Zealand, but are obliged to adopt the methods which others use to defend themselves. To compel an ally to accept nuclear weapons against the wishes of that ally is to take the moral position of totalitarianism, which allows for no self-determination and which is exactly the evil that we're supposed to be fighting against. Yeah. Moscow Television tonight. От Совета министров СССР. На Чернобыльской атомной электростанции произошла авария. Поврежден один из атомных реакторов. For the first time ever, the Soviet Union admits it has had a nuclear accident, and it's clearly a major one. The Soviets might well have said nothing about this accident had not the wind blown the fallout over their neighbors in Scandinavia. Tonight, scientists are warning that radioactive cloud could reach the western United States. Radiation from any source can attack the thyroid, the skin, the lungs, the spleen, the liver, the kidneys, the bone, the muscle, the reproductive organs. It's a fact. Events at Chernobyl have United renewed United Palauans' fears. The nuclear power plants that drive warships have no containment structures. One accident on a visiting ship in Palau's harbor could destroy the entire nation. One, one day, uh, one of my younger sons who is going to elementary school came home to lunch and then uh, we were, they were fixing themselves some sand uh, sandwiches I came and said, fix me one, I, I want to join you. So we started eating together and then all of a sudden this uh, boy said, uh, Mommy, you know money isn't everything.
what I mean is this, that if you Palauans take the compact and give the Palau away, it's terrible. You are crazy. This beautiful Palau, you give it away and take the compact, it's bad and we younger ones won't have a chance to decide for ourselves. We will all be tied up in this uh, compact. We will never have a chance to do anything we think is better for ourselves and our government. I have no doubt that the future generation, if we did, mis if we did wrong at this time, they are going to fight against it. And they will fight for their right too like we are fighting for our right. And uh, at this point, I can safely say that they will hate us for the decision to accept the compact if we do it this time. And uh, that this sentiment is uh, shared by many of us, and I know that. <laughs>